Hume's talking about biases, and my bias was, um, you know, this is a white woman coming from Kansas City. I can probably need to clean myself up a little bit. <laughs> and you walk in, and I'm like, oh my God, you guys totally fit here. <laughs> so it was such a relief to me. Um, and then you both were so great in the class and, and have been since then. Um, and I thought about you a couple weeks ago when all, all this started to boil up. And I just thought, I, I don't even know what to say to reach out because I've been following you on Facebook also. Um, and I just needed to get quiet for a little while. And, <clears throat> and so thank you for, for coming here. And I will also say, I wish I had your courage because I would have that magenta hair in a heartbeat. <laughs> it's the best thing I ever did. Ah. <laughs> All right. So um, th there you go. So Franny's in Kansas City. Her and her husband are a team. Uh, and take it from there, dear. We'll just have a little um, conversation. <clears throat> so, um, you know, for so I've been doing uh, real estate for 12 years. Um, I started working... Um, uh, the uh, urban part of Kansas City, as well as the east side of Kansas City, which East uh, Troost uh, Street is a dividing line um, in Kansas City. A that dividing was actually line for what? For black and white, and was created by J.C. Nichols, who was a huge developer in our city. Actually, he was one of the first presidents of it wasn't NAR at the time, it was called something else in the early 1900s. Um, <clears throat> but he, he actually stole the idea, but he created and taught a bunch of other realtors and developers across the country how to do developments with restrictive covenants and um, also blockbusting and uh, redlining. And so the Troost Street corridor goes all the way north to south um, but divides the city east and west um, and anybody who asks from Kansas City understand that Troost is the dividing line that really displaced and hurt a lot of black people in our city <clears throat> and the restrictive covenants are still on the books so uh, people in our um, uh, it's still urban, but uh, kind of like uh, Hillcrest. No, not like Hillcrest. Um, it's probably a little more integrated. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, there's, there's uh, hotter parts of Kansas City that J.C. Nichols actually developed that there, I would say there's over 100 HOA documents that still that you cannot sell to Negroes, Jews, um, the list it's a pretty Armenians I could go on and on and on those were they're not enforced um, you, but to get them off the books is very expensive and it's something I've been working on for several years um, <clears throat> uh, I started uh, neighborhood by neighborhood but that's really it's not going to work it has to be a state legislation move but anyway so i i've been working in this space for a very long time and um it's interesting my husband who is i'm not sure if you've said you this or not tell him now he's black and um he's not an activist like i am by the way so his feelings don't get hurt that's exactly i mean you're the more outspoken one so that's why i didn't reach out yeah. to him yeah, um, I, he, uh, but he's a great sounding board for me and keeps me in line with what I'm doing uh, as an activist in this space, which is very, very volatile and sensitive. Um, and more so within the realtor industry than in the community. So that's um, interesting. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's the part that uh, I see the, the, the openings happening now, which I'm very happy about. Um, but, well, just in general, you know that we're taught to keep politics, religion, you know, that kind of stuff out of, of our business. Well, I've never been able to do that. And um, 
<laughs> and, You're in good company on this call today. <laughs> so I've not been able to do that. And instead, just like everything in my life, I, I said, yeah, screw that. I'm going to capitalize on making this work for me. And I have built a great brand in a business. Uh, we, my husband, Hubert and I, um, by being an activist and standing up. So we obviously to, even before any of this, um, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's been, this has been going on for me for a long time. As a matter of fact, I have offered classes and training offered to speak on um, redlining and restrictive covenants and how realtors can deal in this, in, in the space of, of making sure fair housing is not being um, violated uh, when we go into the east side of our city, when people ask, well, what's the crime like? And um, so I've offered brokerages and classes and nobody's been really that interested, to be honest, until now. Um, <clears throat> I see well, Valerie, and, and, Valerie shaking her head laughing. Hi, Valerie. <laughs> you know, and it, hopefully it's not surprising that it, it's of interest now. I think part of the, the unfortunate situation around George Floyd is most of us are so blind and so willing to be ignorant as to what happens on a day-to-day -day basis that it right. took something that visible to, to go, oh my goodness, this is still a problem. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you can, I, I, I could be bitter. Hubert could be bitter about it. Like, why now? Why didn't you all listen to us, you know, the last 12 years? But, you know, we're, we're not. It's like, okay, great. It's an opening. Let's go. And, um, um, and you know, one of the things that, and, and I really appreciate, and Hubert does too, Ashley, your sensitivity to, to uh, inviting me. Um, you know, there's there's really a, a, a movement right now that if, if we invite Black people to talk and speak and give us some information, education, that we pay them. Um, and so uh, that's the circles I'm in right now, um, is that we've got to be careful of, of taxing and, and leaning on, um, unless they volunteer and want to do that. Um, it's just, it's an interesting time. So when I told him that this morning, I said, I don't think Ashley invited you because you, she's going to have to pay you. <laughs> and, and that didn't cross my mind. Uh, honestly, yeah. it's because he's the soft-spoken one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was just kidding. He laughed. He thought that was funny. This might um, be of interest to you. Um, and I'm not paying him. One of my good friends, Emmerich Peace, um, and I are every Wednesday morning doing this and having a very open race conversation um, and learning a lot, learning a, an awful lot. Yeah. Well, we started, Hubert and I started our um, Friday morning coffee um, last week. I've been wanting to do it for a long time. Um, and now he feels comfortable finally. It's more, it was more about him than, than me, but he's now ready to speak out about just everything he, he feels. Um, and I will say, here's one other thing that is kind of not really known in the real estate industry um, for a African-American person, um, especially a male. Um, they have extremely hard time getting business with anybody not black. Um, so for instance, our lead generation system, we use Facebook, um, and, and we're generating about 15 to 20 leads a week. Um, cold, you know, warm, warmish, not hot. And um, when he call, he he's our main caller to call and, and chat with people when they come in. And um, if, he, if he assesses that they're white, he will pass them off to one of us white people. Um, he will not take it because he feels like it's a waste of time. They will just, uh, they'll, they'll come up with some reason once they meet to not um, hire him. When I'm going to tell you when we first started in real estate and he was telling me that this is one of those moments in our relationship and in our business that I, I did the, the number one um, no, no for a white person with a black person and said, and I said, no way. That can't be true. 
<laughs> no, you're just not, you're just, uh, you are just, you just got to be more positive. You got to be more positive. You got to look past that. I feel so much better about my white privilege right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, I, I had to really get my bearings around that, to be honest. Because how, how long a, have you two been together, Franny? Uh, Twenty years. So we had to, like, I really had to to allow him to have his his <laughs> understandings, and not me try to apply my. Um, my situation onto it. Now, I will say that there are other black uh, real estate agents in our office and people I've met over the years that are, I mean, Hubert is a little more quiet and not as animated. So he's not, like, he's not trying to win you. Like, he's not going to go into an, a, a, a sales situation and try to win you over. No. Um, but also he, with he, that, there, he's so incredibly non-threatening and warm. Yes, yes, very true. Very, very true, and um, and so it's it, that's been hard for me, really. Uh, it's harder for him, obviously. Um, but uh, I asked him. I said, "So, what happens if we ever fall out, or or I die, or something? What what are you going to do then?" And he's like, "I just have to find another white woman to <laughs> do my business." <laughs> well, so, so so since you went there, what is since you're right on that line, right, of, of trust, what what is your mix? Obviously, it's urban. I'm going to guess for Kansas City, pretty diverse mix of business. But if you racially had to divide it up. Uh, our personal business, I would say we're about 20% black, 80% white. Okay. But, which is about what the population is. We're, we're at about 20% black. Um, so, so we're hitting it right on. Um, I'm, I'm sure we, we are higher than every other white or, or uh, <laughs> interracial uh, team in the city. Not that there are many of those, but uh, do you um, get do you get pushback from other white professionals? Do you do you ever feel like they're looking at you uh, askance? Well, you know, I mean, come on, I've got pink hair, so there, there's that. <laughs> uh, so it's hard to decide uh, what, when that does happen, and it does happen, but, but it's everything from me being a very vocal, um, spirited, um, stand up for, for justice person. I don't hide it. I'm, I'm, and I'm not obnoxious. I'm very nice and professional, but um uh, and I know when to stop. I don't talk. If somebody didn't want to talk about it, I'm not going to talk about it with them. But but it's known. And, and it does isolate me Fair, fairly. It, it does. Like even in my current office. If anybody watching. Hi. Why do you think it's, that it's, is? I have my own theories around that. And I am. Um, I think sometimes when we are known for speaking truth. And that intimidates people, regardless of yes. the circumstances around it. It's so much easier sometimes to just hide and, and yeah. have the niceties, right? And the superficiality. Yeah. Um, and I've yeah. had to work really hard on, on not yeah. letting some of that into my heart. Um, and I found the more that I do that, the more safe people feel. So then they may step into that over yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're, you're, that's pretty accurate. Uh, and honestly, Ashley, I think that the real estate industry, gosh, how do I say this? I say it all the time, but in, in private, uh, court. I, I mean, I, you know, it's it, dropped on here. So, you know, we're, we're probably pretty good. So in, so in Kansas city, I'll just say, because that's my experience, um, that, you know, we, it only takes two weeks of class to get a license here. Right. And so you got to pass the test and come on, anybody could pass the test if they just study. Um, and so we get a wide range of, of people who, I, I think a lot of people come from, from, you know, from being in a nine to five job um, and some freedom for whatever reason, um, the professionalism 
rates is not as high in real estate as they would like it to be. That's no, because that's I think if it was professional, higher education, um, I mean, just the diversity. I mean, Kansas City is not, I don't know, the diversity and, and the, the, the very conservative culture of Missouri and Kansas, not so much Kansas City, but it, it does influence Kansas City. I, I just think there's, um, I think people are going to not stand out in the real estate, in our, in our real estate world, they're just not going to, and they don't really want to associate with anybody who does. Yeah, because then there's and, the by association factor. Yep, yep. And, and so for instance, let me just give you an example of what's going on in on our team. So, you know, we're a pretty successful team. We went through, you know, moving to Keller Williams from our small um, boutique. Um, we had like five agents when we moved over, but we weren't managing them right. We weren't managing our team right. So we came to Keller Williams to learn how to do that better. And, um, and it's been a rough go and we're learning and we've gotten rid of a lot. We've gotten rid of almost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sometimes you need to restart if you didn't start right. Yeah, that's right. And that's where we're at. And we're rebuilding and now COVID. And anyway, so our, our sales are down, but they're still okay. You know, we're, we're not bad. But so within everybody knows Urban Cool KC as a brand in Kansas City. Um, and um, so people will not come knock on our door in our office to be on our team like they do all the other teams. Now, why is that? We, we, we are a lead generator, we've got systems in place. And so I just think it's that, it's that fear. I think, Ashley, what you said, there's an intimidation of somebody who's living their truth and their authenticity, and we're biracial, and so it's weird, right? So I don't think uh, anybody's interested unless we reach out to them. Well, and honestly, you know, obviously being a, an instructor in the leverage series, it's probably best that way because it's saving you a whole heck of a lot of time. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> There's the silver lining. <laughs> I mean, when I was recruiting for our office and I, I as the team leader, I, I would often have to say, I don't know that you're going to be comfortable in this environment. So, you mm -hmm. know, self-selecting on the front end. You, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I would agree uh, with that. All right, so what right now, <clears throat> what right now do you think is the biggest challenge? Let's first say in your community, right? And then in the, in the real estate community. So both of those sections. Um, it, it's been tough I mean, with COVID and, you know, being quarantined and then obviously the, this explosion of frustration and anger, rightly so. Um, what's your community looking like right now? Um, well, we have a pretty corrupt police department. Our chief of police is, is uh, everybody's asking him to resign. Um, we are the only um, city that does not have a local control of our police. It is uh, the state, the governor appoints um, a five member uh, committee to run the police department. So it's appointed by our state. Um, it, the one that- And that's, that's be, Missouri, right? Yes. But you're really close to Kansas City, Kansas too. So yeah. That, yeah. Is there anything weird there? Um, I don't, I'm not following the Kansas side as much as I do the Missouri side. So I'm not sure. Um, the mayor, um, our mayor is black. He's young. He's new to, to the position. He was on city council. He, um, he ran on, um, our previous mayor was also black, but he was a business, uh, developer, uh, a mayor. This mayor is a justice mayor. And, um, and, and he's, he actually ran on, um, on housing, like he, we need more affordable housing. And um, so he's, it's kind of a perfect storm for him to step into this, but you know, he's learning, learning a lot and, and has made some mistakes. Our protests, we, we have protests every night still. It's all, I mean, everywhere in the city, there's protests going on everywhere. 
um, kneeling, nine, kneel for nine, nine kneel, um, just in every, every part of the city that's happening. Um, in the beginning, like almost every other city, the, the police did not handle the protest well, um, were, you know, tear gassed and rubber bullets and people got injured and at the peaceful marchers, not at the looters and, and, you know, we didn't have as much looting and, and, um, violent stuff as, as some of the other cities did, but we had enough that it scared everybody, but, um, but the police were very, very, handled it very poorly and um so probably the first time like here first time they've encountered that in decades yeah yeah it's just i just think they didn't have their sea legs they really didn't quite know what they were doing um and the mayor was also getting his sea legs so he's trying to figure out how to manage between all parties and um and we have quite a few um black men that have been killed uh murdered by the police in the last uh, couple of years, I'd say we've got about seven that the police got let off. Um, and those are now resurfacing and the uh, city is demanding, um, people are demanding that, um, that they be addressed or those who are supposed to be addressed them needs to go. And we get in um, um, a new group. Uh, uh, and that's probably we, odd, only because when you said the governor really controls it, so that state level, Kansas City being way more liberal, right, than the rest of the state, there's probably right. a lot of right push pull there. Right. Yeah, it's weird because the 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 governor, who is very Republican, um, does not um, really interfere much. I mean, it's a weird situation. Um, it still needs to be locally controlled. They they took away the local control because of corruption and um, that the mayors of the past were appointing um, their buddies and it was highly racist. And so that's why it actually was supposed to solve the problem that it's still not solving. Um, but just like everywhere too, our, um, our union, our uh, fraternal order of police is also creating the problem, it's big of the problem that when these police officers are being um, looked at when they have these, um, excessive force or murders, um, the, the union is, is saying, let them off. And so, you know, so we're, we're, we're falling in line with just about every other city with, with trying to, to uh, change that. We, there is the movement for defunding, but um, we haven't got as far as others, like Minneapolis is really far along in that um, way. We're, we're not quite there yet. I think that's gonna be a bigger leap for us to start moving I think we'll do it, but we won't call it defunding. That's just too 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 hard for people to understand right now. Yeah. Um, but I we think, did. Get, I think most people could past. understand that better by reallocation. <laughs> it's it's really yeah. not funding. It's reallocation. Right. I know. I know. I wish they would not have named it that. But um, we did finally get we 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 had uh uh God, what happened with our body cams? We've had body cams ready to go. Um, but needed some more money or something, and the, with the money was there, but they were holding on. Anyway, it finally, that finally got passed, so now the body cams are coming. I right. mean, we're so far behind in that way, but but the city is, um, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty hot. We're pretty live. Um, it, you know, and it's interesting. I'm sure everybody else here know, has been seeing this, too. I'm just so amazed that, like, even my clients, uh, who I know they've come to us for diversity, but have never really said much are like all now black lives matter, all their posts and all this. And it's just like, Oh my God. And I'm trying to give them as much love as I can. And it's like, yay, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> well, again, I think because if you're in the community, right. Um, it's so easy. It, it's been one of the painful realizations for me. And I am going to, plug the book again. Um, I know it's getting a lot of talk now, but White Fragility, if you, it, I would highly encourage you to listen to or read it, and it will take a lot to really absorb it. Um, it was a yeah. very challenging book for me because I had to look in the mirror in a lot of ways. Um, and one of those was I have just not intention, mm, intentionally, but for other reasons, created the world I want, right? I, I don't allow people without right bias into my circle. 
<laughs> if, right. I, if I uh, perceive that you've got a racial bias or um, sexual orientation bias, I'm just going to keep my distance. And I've done that yeah. so well that there are times when I, I have to travel outside of my circle to go, oh gosh, these things are still as prevalent as they have been. I'm just right. selectively not seeing it. Yeah. So yeah. people you know, in, in your I, sphere, I think, probably have had the same, oh my gosh. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think the White Fragility book, you know, there's quite a few books out and it's like, which do you read? Um, I would say that's a great book to start with. Uh, I, I think what, I have a book club right now. Uh, we're reading anti, uh, Anti-Racism. That's nice. Um, or Anti-Racist by uh, Ibram uh, Kendi. And um, it's, it's really much more of a push. Like, like if you're kind of putting your toes in the water of trying to, to, to be a, an ally and a supporter, um, White Fragility is a great book uh, to, to get started. But if, if you kind of, if you know somebody's kind of been at this for a little while and want to go to the next level, the, the um, becoming, how to be an anti-racist is, is like a next step of activism. Like first you got to learn and be sensitive and, and listen and step back and take in and not be an activist if you don't know what you're, you're if you don't, if you've got a lot of blinders until you learn. But then once you're past that and you're ready to really take some action, then I think the anti-racist, just, just a lot of the language that we still use and I use, I catch myself, I'm like, holy crap, you know, like just using the word systemic racism. Uh, Racism covers systemic. I mean, really, you don't need to use <laughs> just little things like that. And I and I will say one other thing that I think uh, uh, Hubert and I were trying to get another group together. He went to a book club. It's been ten years ago. Um, uh, Afraid of the dark, and it's a book designed for a a community to come together, a group of people to be led by a black person, not a white person. And it needs to be a mix of black and white. Um, more black than white is preferable, honestly, but um, equal amount. And the questions in the book are really designed to allow the black people to talk and the white people to listen. And it is, uh, so Hubert, it was an eight week um, group that he went to and he told me that I, and I was traveling at the time so I didn't get to be part of it but he said at the end of every session the black people would say to the white people thank you so much for listening that it's the first time that they've had the experience of white people just listening and without interrupting without saying that can't be true um, being defensive um, and then Hubert told me that it was the most healing thing he's ever been part of. Like he would love to see more of these because it, it, it just, it's powerful. And so I think some of these book clubs and people getting together and reading, I think it's a good start and it needs to happen no matter what. If you read something, you're going to get better. Yeah. But I think at some point we're going to have to come together and talk with each other. I don't, I, you know, we got to do a certain amount of our own work as white people um, and not expect black people to, but I do think we're going to have to listen and start healing that way. Um, otherwise, it's going to still be, yeah, it's really still going to be a little bit separate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great of the Dark. It's a great book. I'm going to pick that one That's up. That's a great that's a great, it's, it's, boy, it's a, you're going to have, you have to have a good facilitator for it though. It's, it's, it's very sensitive. And, and so it's not for everybody. Okay. So let's go to the real estate world then. Um, Cause usually it's just a microcosm of the overall culture and often amplified. Right. So, um, and I'm curious, honestly, um, as an OP, I'll put my OP hat on now. Um, if you were in my market center, um, what would you be expecting us as leaders in a market center to do? How could we actually help you as a business owner, help you as an activist? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, 
you know, I have so much knowledge and experience that I've been working for so many years on this just to listen. And, and, and I think, I think there should be classes. I mean, there's, there's no reason that somebody who's like myself has been working in this space who has um, enough knowledge to offer. Uh, and I think there would be a real desire for that right now, right? That the realtors would want to, to learn. Um, I, I think that's a, a first start is just having another realtor who, who can talk about it, um, help to guide realtors in this space. And like, what, what, what are our blind spots as realtors? Um, when you like talk heard, about redlining, and I'm sure it still happens here too, I, I've heard the conversations, and, and yet most people who are participating in that wouldn't call it redlining. Right. It's, it's very subtle now. It's not as, oh, yeah. as, as well, we out want there better schools, be. right? We want crime, crime rates to be low. Right. It's all coded language. And so here, let me tell you where it happens in Kansas City that people are not aware of, that I talk about all the time, I bring it up all the time. Redlining is happening in Kansas City with insurance and appraisals. It's not happening with lending as much because they're being watched, right? It's happening, but it's, it's I, and you know, the appraisers are connected to, to lending, so that's sort of in there. So how is that showing up? When you say it's happening with insurance and appraisals, how's that right. showing up? How do they even know the race of the person buying the home? Right, so uh, by zip code, insurance is triple what it is from, so like, so just recently I sold a house on Truce, remember the Truce Street of ours, well, I'm, I'm sorry, on Paseo, Paseo's east of Truce, a little bit deeper, um, and uh, listen, y'all, it was a $125,000 house, and it was a, a, a wonderful woman who bought it, single, um, African-American, Nobody knew that in the, the in the the process. The insurance company didn't know that. Um, so she, you know, she has a, a strict budget of how she's making this happen for herself for the first time buying her first home. And um, so she went to get her insurance, and literally, it was triple, triple what uh, anybody else on the other side of the of the truce line was paying for the same square footage. Um, and the insurance companies will say, well, it's crime. It's crime. We've got to go by crime rate. Well, that's not true. That's bullshit. Because the crime rate a few blocks over is the same as the crime rate uh, on this side of the street. And so, and, and what crime are you talking about? So crime is, is a, there's a variety of crime, right? There's, there's, uh, and why does crime have to be such a big deal for insurance? I, I mean, you know, it's uh I, I get if, if someone's going to come in and steal stuff and, and um, you know, the biggest thing in, in, in poverty neighborhoods, then you're, you know, we get air conditioner units stolen all the time. That's, that's common. And everybody knows that. And they put a cage around their air conditioner unit and then the problem is solved. There really is no problem. These houses are not being broken into. It's just anything that's out and about. They're going to, the, the people are going to steal if, if they can get their hands on it. So it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's the same as, as having a credit, like, like you have to hit it, like your credit score also increases, your lower credit score increases your insurance. Right. So this all starts to connect to poverty and poverty is connected to race. So, um, so I see that all the time, appraisals. So when we've had, uh, as every other city has had in the last five years, uh, uh, you know, our average is 6% increase in sales price every year across the, the metro. Um, and, and so appraisers are having to, you know, they can't go just by past sales because then we'd never sell a freaking house. <laughs> so they know they've got to, got to move with that. And so they have on the west side of town, but not on the east side of town. So they're not moving the prices up like they should be, but by that 6% margin, they're, they're going by past sales. And so we're not able to sell houses on the east side of town to people who really want to buy these houses. I mean, it's ridiculous. So that's another 
form of redlining, right? So we're keeping people from, we're keeping black people from buying property all over again. Yeah. And white people get to buy it, black people don't. So it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, 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 so these are things that I don't think realtors know. Like, I think they, if they happen to sell, by the way, most of our realtors in Kansas City, I, I can name 10 that will go on the east side of Troost. <clears throat> um, so, uh, and we have 11,000 agents in our metro. Wow. So, um, I'm, and when I say 10, 10 that I know do it, like they work yeah. it, they, it's, it's. And how many of them are problems black? With it. Um, I'd say 75%. Yeah. When I talk to white agents about where they're doing their business, like, so we've had a lot of suburb agents coming into the city because it's hot right now, right? Prices have gone up in a lot of our, our, our urban neighborhoods <clears throat> that are not on the east side. And so when I ask them about, are they working the all neighborhoods? Are you working all neighborhoods uh, as you come into, like, when I see a sign that I'm like, wait, what are they doing in the hood? What what's going on here? <laughs> I'm like I'm calling I'm calling like, what are you doing? <laughs> you're not you don't belong here. <laughs> but anyway, so they'll list the house, but they won't show buyers. Oh, that's and and um and and so they'll refer it out to to somebody else to go show these to go show the east side. And so I will get a lot of agents who say we don't work the east side of the town. And I'm like, how's this possible in this industry? How are we getting away with, with you claiming that? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Well, thank I, God you're I, there, dear. <laughs> well, because it's an under, obviously underserved, underappreciated mm -hmm. population. Um, and part of me says, well, thank God. If they have that little sensitivity, thank God they're referring it out. Yeah, and that's true. And, you know, we, we, so a lot of our east side neighborhoods are starting to transition and, um, you know, houses are being flipped and renovated. Um, are you seeing Hubert and I actually? Okay, this is where it's going. So, so Hubert and I got, um, we, we also renovate a few of our own houses. And so we got called in because um, we had posted a house on our Facebook page that had been really uh, increased in price. It wasn't even on the east side of Truce. It was close enough that people were thinking, oh, my God, this tripled in price and yada, yada, yada. So gentrification got brought up. So we got called to, to speak on a, a local radio, um, one of our public radio stations on gentrification. Now, we came in and said, look, we're not, we're not experts on gentrification. It's a pretty deep subject. And honestly, though, we are not experiencing gentrification. We're, we, I'm, gentrification is, uh, and I'll tell you what Hubert said that they're experiencing instead that they've got to be careful about. But, um, you know, there's, we have maybe one neighborhood that has been really developed and it's over, you know, close to million dollar homes now in, wow. in the middle of a, an area that you're like, what? One, one neighborhood. Okay, so we're not told, not every neighborhood east of Truce is gentrified. <clears throat> it could come that way, but I don't think so. I think we're not that fast moving city. You know, we don't have a, a, a lot of that going on. But what Hubert told them is here's the problem when you have a bunch of white people moving into a neighborhood because the houses are cheaper and you're still kind of close to the cool neighborhoods. Um, what black people don't like is that, that, they get the police get called more often when white people move for them just walking down the street and that's what hubert has told me over and over again that i would never have known as a white person that's an issue when white people move into black neighborhoods that are starting to gentrify is that oh, they, they they call the police and and black people um are front porch this is a generalization, all right, but in most black neighborhoods, in Kansas City anyway, it may not be this way in every city across the country, but they hang out on their front porch. They, they enjoy uh, socializing on the front porch and, and socializing with each other in the neighborhood. It can get kind of loud and obnoxious, but it's all fun, and white people don't like it. They, they, they feel like that's, that's disturbing the peace and and so they call the police. So black people will tell you here in Kansas City, do not do not move into our neighborhood. 
because you're going you're going to cause problems. <laughs> it's so interesting. So I, I I tell my clients, my white buyer clients who are buying, um, because I I people come to me because I know where to help people buy houses that are a lot less uh, expensive and but still in really cool spots. And um, I, t I tell them, here's what you're going to experience in a culture that's different than maybe the culture you have been around up to this point. And so I'm just giving you a heads up. This is, this is something that you're going to have to be sensitive about and you should be sensitive about. And so you just, their eyes just get so big, like, wow, boy, you would never even thought about that. No, I'm and I love you that, that you're setting people. that expectation. I, in San Diego, we're, we're the same here. Uh, I don't know how many white agents would know that, but I've lived in two predominantly black neighborhoods in San Diego. And for me, I would phrase it a different way. Yeah, they're definitely front porch communities. And it's a sense of community. I never felt safer anywhere. My neighbors had my back because we all knew each other versus a lot of the more suburban neighborhoods where people drive into their home and they never come back out. Yeah. That's exactly what I said. Like, you know, it is. It's a people think this less safe here. It's more safe because of that. I totally agree with that, and I explain. And you know, I I have I will tell you that most of my clientele that will go by on the east side of the town are millennials. They're they're you know, and and they're millennials that have their own diversity, like you know, gay, lesbian, biracial. Um, they're just so much more not in, interested in not being ignorant. Yeah. It's very, it's a very interesting thing. And they talk about it, they're open about it. They're not, I think my generation uh, doesn't talk about it. Like we don't talk about this stuff, right? It's like, I'm feeling it, but I'm not going to tell you what I'm feeling, you know? And, and, and I, again, I always tell people, look, I have to, I have to be careful what I say to you as, as a, a licensed realtor with the fair housing. <laughs> um, I, I can't say a lot about race, to be honest. And I say that up front. Before we even step into a neighborhood, I pre-call that out in our first meeting and just say, because you've come to me for this reason and we're gonna be looking in diverse neighborhoods, um, you, you can't ask me about crime, you can't ask me about this, here are the websites, go to them. Um, but just so you know, crime is everywhere. And uh, so, so we just kind of get that part out of the way um, before we end up in a neighborhood and I have to, to explain crime, you know. Right. Um, but I also, so teach people how to find a good neighborhood. Like, what is a good neighborhood? What is a safe neighborhood? What does that mean exactly? And um, so I'll drive them through neighborhoods all over and I'll say, look, here are the signs of, of a neighborhood taking care of itself. They're, 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 they're working together. You can tell by the way the yards look and the houses look and, and um, not just because a black person walked down the street. Right. I mean, that that doesn't make a bad neighborhood. So, you know, anyway, no. I could go on for days, Ashley. <laughs> ah, well, I so appreciate what, what you're doing there. Um, and, and for being on, on here to, you know, just give us a different perspective. Um, you guys haven't been to San Diego in a while, I don't think, but you sure as heck better pop by next time. Whenever yeah, we, we were there, out and travel. We were there a year ago. Uh, I've, uh, no, actually, we were there in February, or March, right before COVID hit. I was at a social media marketing conference, um, but it was packed. I was busy the, every day of, of, of the conference that we were there. But, and we planned to come back in August, but I'm not sure we're going to make it. I'm Let us sure. know for but sure. What, can, can, I, can I make a plug real quick? Absolutely. Um, so I've started, um, I'm, I'm one, I am coaching and providing some online uh, programs for realtors across the country um, on being a community influencer. And um, so I, I want to not only to be just a community influencer, because that's a good thing to do, but also how you can build your business by being a community influencer. And so... Um, 
so I, um, I, I've been working on um, doing this coaching for a couple of years and just been putting the, putting it together slowly. And it's finally, I'm finally getting it together. So I'm just pay attention. I, I have the, a group um, up uh, right I'm now. In the group. Do you have any additional info than just that Facebook group? If you could send that to me, I will get it out. Yeah, it's coming. I'm getting, um, I will be uh, doing a master class. It's a free master class to, to do the overall um, what I'm doing basically. And so that'll be announced in that group and that, and that'll be a recorded, it'll be a Facebook live and it'll be a recorded video that you can watch, you can send to other people later as what, what does this really mean? What am I going to be teaching? So it's a mix of being, you know, standing up for, for things in your community with taking that brand and using social media to, to spread the word and to gather people like yourself so that then they trust you to be your realtor. So that's kind of the gist of it. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Get that. We'll blast it out. Well, thank Great. you. I know. Is it a listing appointment you're going on? Yes. <laughs> In a Go, get it. Go get it. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Um, and uh, really just have, uh, you've got my heart and, and a ton of respect from, from our agents. Thank you. Thank you for leading the way. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate it. It was so right, fun. Hon. Take care. Okay. Okay. Bye, Bye. everybody.